The third day of Imagination Week, we have a great honor, it's a great privilege to welcome Professor Muhammad Yunus. I will introduce him very quickly, because actually if I share with you all what he's done, actually it can take hours. So just quite quickly, Professor Muhammad Yunus is Nobel laureate, Nobel laureate. Professor Muhammad Yunus is a father of both social business and microcredit the founder of Grameen Bank, and of more than other 50 companies in Bangladesh. He designed what we call social business, a business created solely for solving people's problem without taking any personal profit by the investors except to recoup the original investment. After original investment comes back, all subsequent profits are plugged back into the business. That's basically the purpose of social business. For his constant innovation, initiative, enterprise, the Fortune magazine named Professor Yunus in March 2012 as the one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time. In 2006, Professor Yunus and Grameen Bank were jointly awarded Nobel Peace Prize. He is the recipient of 61 honorary degrees from university across 24 countries. He has received 136 awards from 33 countries, including state owners from 10 countries. He is one of only seven individuals to have received the Nobel Peace Prize, the United States Presidential Medals of Freedom, and the United States Congressional Gold Medal. He has appeared on the cover of Time magazine, Newsweek, and Forbes magazine. It's a great honor, again, Professor Yunus, to welcome you this afternoon. It's a great pleasure as well. The floor is yours, and then we're going to interact a bit with the student. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted that I could uh, get this chance to talk about the issues that have been uh, with me for a while because of the pandemic. So pandemic kind of pushed me into many different areas and I've been watching it and I've been explaining it, what the, this sense makes a response to from my side. And uh, one I was trying to see uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, as you all uh, been noticing it, in every single country it's happening. So nobody is away from uh, watching the pandemic uh, developing, extend, extending, moving on and still not the end is not in sight. In the beginning, what I noticed uh, is the lightning speed in which the pandemic uh, started and expanded to the whole world. It was a tiny little news uh, in, a, in a back page or inner page of a newspaper. There's something uh, happened in Yuan and uh, China. And nobody paid any attention to it, it's a local issue. Uh, but he had not realized that in less than 100 days since you saw the first time the news in the mentioned in the newspaper, uh, within 100 days, uh, it was a global phenomenon and it uh, invaded the entire world in a lightning speed. And uh, inv invasion was complete. The whole world uh, surrendered. Uh, they took shelter behind the doors of their own homes because they could not go outside. So this is something uh, uh, unheard of, uh, unbelievable, that the people could uh, become such a subject um, and can be conquered so easily. The second one that struck me, when you are facing a global enemy like uh, Corona virus, COVID-19, you would expect that the, in the whole world will uh, get together to face this common enemy. Because it's not an uh, enemy for one country or enemy for one uh, nationality or one kind of people or one age group or nothing. It's uh, everywhere, every single country, every single age group, every single uh, ethnic group, doesn't matter. It, it didn't distinguish, it attacked everybody. So in that situation, you imagine probably that uh, the whole world pulled together, uh, shake hands with each other to 
mobilize all the resources to combat that, to stop that. But that's not what happened. Uh, it just happened the other way. Uh, the, every country, every nation went back to their own territory or trying to protect themselves rather than protecting others, even to talk to other people. Even to the disadvantage of other people, they tried to create advantage for themselves. Uh, they became selfish in other way. Uh, so this is another uh, kind of observation that you see. Uh, you, we didn't beha behave in a, more, in a rational way that you would imagine that everybody would be working together to stop this uh, uh, massive attack, uh, unpredictable, unknown attack that uh, is so sudden and so unknown that you will be gathering strength by being together. So we, we didn't have a common uh, structure to face this common enemy. Only thing we had from the past is a common uh, organization which is responsible for addressing such issue. Uh, this was the WHO, the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization was created as a global organization to face uh, health issues. And this was a massive health issue, not just a small, tiny one in one country or one group of people. So they automatically came in the forefront. So expectation was this would be supported by every country, every society, every nation, every government, so that they can be uh, strong enough to handle this task that suddenly they were entr uh, entrusted with. But that's not what happened. Uh, major country in the world attacked the WHO, uh, diminished its importance, uh, attacked it by reducing or uh, stopping uh, financing the WHO. So this is exactly the reverse of what should have been done. And then uh, started the investigation procedure for uh, WHO uh, from the uh, most uh, important country in the world, uh, economically, politically, uh, the leadership that they wanted from that country didn't come, it came in a reverse way. So these are the kind of examples that uh, we behave in a wrong way, uh, how uh, we should have done. And when it's uh, spreading around the world, uh, people were very uh, shocked, behaved in a different ways. They didn't learn from each other. They tried to reinvent the whole wheel on their, themselves and cause many problems. Still, it's going on. It's, a, it's not a unified policy or unified. We are not learning from our own experience. And in the process, we are always talking about uh, uh, the economy. Economy became a big issue. The most important issue that came in the economy was uh, life versus livelihood. Whether we should be supporting the life against the livelihood or su support the livelihood against the life. And that became a controversy and I joined that controversy in my own way, supporting the life, that life has uh, no uh, trading arrangement with anything. It's a unique, it's a very precious, uh, so it should not be uh, uh, kind of in a trading situation with uh, livelihood or something else. So how to protect the life and do everything else. So this is a kind of issue still remains unresolved, but uh, everybody is trying to figure out in their own way. Everybody was worried uh, right from the beginning about the economy. Economy stalled, economy stopped completely. The economic engine uh, was put to sleep. Corona uh, pandemic has come. And that's the uh, biggest thing that it has done by putting people in the back of their house, in the back of their, uh, their room, uh, the, the, the economy became totally dysfunctional. And all governments and all uh, businesses, everybody got very concerned. They came up with declarations, with preparations, how to restart the engine. So that became a massive issue, how to restart the engine itself. And uh, they came out with what they call bailout packages. Uh, some came out with billions of dollars of bailout packages, meaning that government will put so much money uh, to restart the engine so that we can go back to where we are coming from. Uh, so that the engine starts functioning in its full force. Uh, it's, 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 it's a full steam and so on. Some had the, not only multi-billion, 
a multi-trillion dollars committed, already packages made, waiting for this to be spent and so on. So that became a big uh, preparation. Means, uh, while we are worrying about the life of many people for survival, at the same time, government was preparing millions and billions and trillions of dollars in starting the engine back again. And that gave me an idea that, uh, that came as a question in my thinking. Why are we so concerned about going back? Going back to where we are coming from. And I look back where we are coming from uh, a few days back, eight months back. Uh, that's not a very happy world. It's a world, uh, it was a terrible world. Do we have to really go back to that world? I thought the pandemic has done us a great service by stopping the engine. Uh, and that engine shouldn't be started to go back again. Uh, and I see, I start to explain to uh, people that we were in a high speed train, in a bullet train, going very fast to our disaster. That's what uh, our uh, pre pandemic world was. We were in a high speed train going to end our life in this planet in a few years time. And uh, that will be the destination of this uh, 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 high speed train. I said, Corona has done something very fundamental. It has stopped the train. We couldn't stop the train. So we were in the train and waiting, counting days uh, to end this world. So, but now that the train is a stop, we can get off the train and look around and ask ourselves the question, <clears throat> should we go back to the train or should we uh, create another train to go someplace else? We don't want to get into this train which is heading for a disaster. Why is it a disaster? I keep calling the disaster end of the world and so on. Because that's what we are talk talking about before the corona came, you remember? All our teenagers were marching on the street, uh, accusing their parents, their grandparents, for being uh, so irresponsible to uh, create a world where young people uh, have no uh, future for themselves. They call themselves uh, Fridays for Future, and every Friday they will be on the street, not in one city, not in cities in Europe, it's all over the world. And the young people were demonstrating against their own parents, against their own Elder, elder people, and the grandparents and so on, for being responsible, for being cruel to them, cruel to their younger generation, making them, uh, offering them a world which has no future for them, them. So this will be the end of the world. They were not, they were talking about themselves as a, they don't have a future. Now imagine what would be the uh, life like for the grandchildren, these are the children. And what would be the life for the grandchildren? The grandchildren will probably will have no life at all. At least these, these children are in teenage level. So that's the kind of world that we're coming from. Uh, since we are trying to stop that world, uh, making, being uh, responsible and redesign the world in a different way for, so that our next generation and future generation can have a better life uh, for future. Uh, so there's no reason why we should go back. Uh, this we take as an opportunity, a grand opportunity to create another kind of world. So we should be thankful to uh, pandemic rather than uh, angry with it uh, because it has stopped the train. It's not only global warming which is hurting us. It's not only one thing that the world was uh, so terrible uh, that we are coming from. It was also the very ugly type of uh, uh, wealth concentration. All the wealth is concentrated in just a handful of people. And a handful of people owning all the wealth of the world and the uh, rest of the population of the world has no access to any wealth at all. A very tiny fraction of that world uh, wealth goes to the majority, 99% uh, of the population of the world. So what kind of world would that be? Where all the wealth keep on going, not only is going, it's already concentrated in the hands of few people and it continues to go faster and faster concentration. So I said, uh, this is the ticking time bomb it will explode anytime. It's just a social explosion, political explosion, because nobody can live in a society where all the wealth continuously goes in one direction. Uh, I try to explain by saying that it's almost like our body. If you continue, if you think about society as our body, all the blood in our body is rushing to the uh, 
uh, finger, one fingertip. Every, every, all the world, blood is in one fingertip. If you have that, that's not a healthy body. It's a, just waiting for a collapse because the blood is not circulated in your system. This is just concentrated in one fingertip. So that's what exactly happening in the economy right now. It's a, before the pandemic came. I said, we should be grateful to pandemic that it stopped the process because by stopping the engine, uh, it has stopped that process. Now we can restart the process in a different way where wealth will not be concentrated in few hands, but wealth will be shared in many, many hands, all the hands of the world. So how to design that? So this is another one that the, the, this world was uh, not something that we should be look forward to going back to. Another one, third one that I should put in, I'll stop there uh, in that uh, explanation why we don't want to go back. Uh, the other one is uh, massive unemployment. Uh, we are, we are seeing this happening, but we are not noticing it. Uh, this is coming through artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is coming in a big way. Uh, we don't even pay any attention to it. We see it as a fun, like we see it in a movie or something. Uh, it's not going to touch us. It was going to touch uh, all of us because in less than 15 years, uh, nearly billion people will be out of job. Billion people will be out of job. Not They are not looking for new job. This is a separate category who are waiting for the job. These are the people who are on the job, running this whole economy, and they will be out of job because machines will take over. The argument is machines can do better. Artificial intelligence can do better than human beings. So why should we keep the human beings on the work? Let them go. We'll push the artificial intelligence in the place. And that is only because that makes our uh, bottom line uh, very attractive. We make more money by replacing human being with artificial intelligence. Uh, that's the only, only reason why we're pushing human being away. The question is, if you create that massive unemployment, where would the human being go? Do we have any plan for that? No, we don't. We say somebody will take care of it. Some even say that government should take care of it. Uh, we in business are busy making money. I said, that's not the kind of world that we would like to go back. Uh, we want to create a different kind of world and people, when they are asked the question, what kind of world that would be? I said, it's very simple. It's a, answer is very simple. Everything that we see is happening in the world that we are coming from should be free in the new world. It should not happen in the new world. So we create a world, I kept saying that it's a sort of a world of three zeros. Uh, here we have a problem of uh, global warming, that the new world will have zero net carbon emission. And uh, that's the one feature of the new world that we can build and we can create that new world of, uh, of uh, zero net carbon emission. No uh, uh, carbon emission will continue. Uh, then the second one will be zero uh, unemployment. Uh, we will remove that artificial intelligence thing from that world in that, uh, at least in the job situation, artificial intelligence can be good, artificial intelligence can be bad. I'm talking about the bad part of artificial intelligence, that any technology can be a blessing, can be a curse. And artificial intelligence becomes a curse when it, it removes human being from its own jobs on its creative activity that they want to do. Then it becomes a curse for human being. We don't want to have that in that direction. We can have artificial intelligence for many other things, like in healthcare, in in education, many other things we can use artificial intelligence, as long as it doesn't take over the role of the human beings in everyday life you know, so that they can come, uh, perform their uh, livelihood and so on. So this, those are the three zeros that we can help in the making this new world happen, uh, continue to happen. The question is, can we make it? Is it possible? to create, uh, create a new track and go to a new destination. And it's for, for a simple reason, because if you stay on the same track, the, engine, the, uh, the train was going with, that the, uh, the speed, high speed train that was going uh, on the track, that old track will always take us to the same destination, destination of immediate disaster, immediate end of the world, you know, reaching the finishing line of the world. We don't want to go to that track. So we need to have a new track. Old, old roads always take you 
to old destination. So we have to, if you want to go to the new destination, we have to build new roads. So this is an occasion to build those new roads. And what would be this? It's a, people may argue that, well, it's easy to say, build new roads. How do you do that? Again, I would say it's very simple. It's not complicated because we know who created all our problems. If you look at the global warming, if you look at the global warming, we know exactly who did the global warming. We have all the studies, we have all the facts and figures, who contributed how much in the global warming, how much contribution came from the fossil fuel, for example. It is the biggest contributor in uh, uh, global warming. So we know who are these fossil fuel uh, contributors uh, to the global warming. We know the names, we know the addresses, we know the amount and so on. So we said, okay, if you're going to the new world, we'll put some kind of a check post uh, anybody who's carrying the fossil fuel with them into the new world will tell them, so sorry, you cannot bring the fossil fuel with us, with you. And uh, you have to abandon that business. You have to create a new kind of energy system, uh, the green energy. So if, you're, if you can do the green energy, most welcome. We'll, we'll put uh, flowers in your hand and let you go in our uh, new world. So we will stop you from going there. So it's known people, known organizations, and something that we have to make a decision that whether we should let it go or we don't let it go. Uh, all the billions of dollars in bailout packages, all the trillions of dollars in bailout packages, they are waiting to go into these industries to revive them. I said, here we are talking about stopping them. Why should you spend a penny on them? There's no question about putting the money rather than we stop them, rather than give the money. So give the money to the people who are doing the green energy bring out the bailout packages who will start from the scratch map. They have not done it yet, but they have a good uh, idea. They can start that uh, green energy, uh, renewable energy and so on, uh, move on in that. So those money is already available. It's not something we're asking for a new money. Money is already allocated for restarting the engine. And only thing we're saying, don't restart the old engine, build a new engine. And we know where the old engine, uh, new engine can be built. So we do that. Uh, and we'll see that all plastic should not go into the new world. So we'll stop the plastic too. In the new world, plastic doesn't come. So case by case, we can find out what is contributing to the global warming, what is contributing to the wealth concentration, who is guilty of contributing to the wealth concentration, who is guilty of in introducing wealth, uh, into artificial intelligence. These are all known. Simply, we have to make a decision. It's all, to me, it's almost like um, obesity. Like uh, somebody gets uh, really obese, they really disproportionately uh, uh, this with a disproportionate body. Uh, he or she knows that uh, uh, the body is totally uh, unacceptable, unhealthy body. And we know what the cure is: that you have to do the dieting, you have to do the exercise. So it's already known. But if you don't do the exercise, you don't do the dieting. Of course, your body will never change and continue to in the path of the obese. So this is the situation of our old world versus new world. We know what it is, but Corona has given us an opportunity to make very firm decision that we don't want to do. Uh, continue with the same old way. We want to do it a new way so that we can create the world that we want. So this is an opportunity that we have to look at. The one, another point I will quickly add in, in this, it's about uh, uh, corona, what the pandemic has done, it built, brought out all the weaknesses of the society. Uh, it revealed itself. And one particular one I mentioned, uh, when the initial period of uh, lockdown is still going on in India, for example, uh, one big news came everywhere. The millions of people from the city, big cities, kind of, kind of coming out, uh, going to the street, going to the highways, walking on food, going hundreds of miles to go back home because they couldn't afford to stay in the city because there is no income anymore because all their income stopped because the economy is not functioning. So they are jobless, they are incomeless. These are informal sector people, all the informal sector, those who are selling things on the street by uh, fixing things on the streets, serving in the families, doing odd jobs and so on. Uh, handicrafts people, and suddenly you knew that, you knew that all these people are there, but you didn't realize how many of them are there, how many, what are the conditions. But now it became visible in millions of people. And the sad story that they're going back, they want to go back. 
they had no transportation because in, during lockdown period, there was no transportation. So they had dared to come to the highway, walking home with their children, with their family, to go back hundreds of miles walking. So that's the kind of ultimate the revelation, the one part of it. And I raised the question, why we have not been able to create an economy in a different way? Why people have to leave their home hundreds of miles away, go someplace for just a survival livelihood? Why can't we create survival livelihood where people are born, where they grow up? The survival livelihood should be around them, not 100 miles away from them. If you want to go 100 miles away for a better reason, to make more money, be prosperous and so on, go ahead, do that, but not for survival purposes. Survival livelihood could be and organized where you are born. That's the first task of any economist or any economic thinking that this is what you should do. Then I look around, all the rural areas are like that. And in, in many countries like India, Bangladesh, South Asia, and Latin America or Africa, it's a rural economy basically. But the rural economy was never recognized as a legitimate economy. It was an appendix of the urban economy. The urban economy is the economy. So the uh, rural economy is supposed to be the uh, uh, labor pro producing factory uh, for the urban cities so that the, all the people can have jobs. They come to the city to get the jobs and make a living in the, in the city. They have to abandon their rural areas and so on. So this is the kind of uh, uh, sad situation that uh, we had to face in uh, uh, seeing the corona coming up. And then the question came, why couldn't we have independent rural economy? Why do we have to have this, uh, it's an appendix of urban economy. What's wrong with the rural economy? The argument is urban economy is important because it has the infrastructure. It has the transportation, it has the banking facilities, it has the communication, local networks and so on. Well, that is true, but that was true in the past. Today, that is not true because the communication is everywhere, even in India and Bangladesh. You can go anywhere you want, the highways are everywhere, transportation is everywhere, the tracking is everywhere, uh, river transportation is everywhere. So this is a different time. So the, you cannot say that the city is the only place where you can go, other places you cannot go uh, because there's no transportation, there's no highway. So the situation has changed, but our mind has not changed. Our mind is stuck hundreds of years of back. So we are still considering Rural area is the back, backyard of the urban area, our urban economy. They have to serve the urban economy. They have to send their uh, people to find a livelihood in the urban area because the rural area cannot create that uh, livelihood for them. And then they have to send all the agricultural inputs because rural areas where the agriculture thrives, that's where the productions are made, agricultural production is made. So all those raw materials have to be supplied to the city so that the people from rural area come into the urban area and the inputs coming from the rural area to the city and the people and the uh, uh, produce can now be uh, converted into other consumer goods and so on and so forth. I said, this is very funny. People have to come all the way hundreds of miles away to come to the city and the products has to be produced in, in the rural area and transported to the city for them to get together and process it. Why can't they do it where this born? The guy is born there, the production is done there. Why can't they set it up in their own way? That idea has never crossed our mind because we are already blocked our mind that everything has to be in the city. So I said, now you have the telecommunication. Everybody has a phone, everybody has internet connection. Uh, you can do anything you want. Why do you have to have the call centers? For example, in India, massive amount of call centers and so on. I said, why should the call centers be located in the city? What is it that a city has than the rural areas? Rural areas, uh, air quality is much better. Uh, you can have a plenty of space, you can do that. And the telecommunication system is as good as the urban city. So why don't you have your uh, uh, call centers right there in the villages? Why can't you have the universities located in the, in the uh, rural areas so that the young people don't have to go to the city to get a higher education and so on and so forth. So it's a call mental issue. So we have to create independent rural economy. Then we see everything can happen in a different way. 
So rural economy means informal economy, see? Because we have abundant them. Economists uh, think that unless you are a formal economy, they have nothing to do with it. And all the rural economy, all the people who live in the rural economy is the informal economy. And informal, by calling them informal, you are almost dismissing them. They have nothing to do with it. They have nothing, not, no role to play in economy, in the informal. In order to play a role in the, in the formal economy, they have to buy the ticket for the job. They can have a job, and for the job, they have to come to the city. Then you become the formal economy. I said, that's a shame, because all these people who are now walking on the highway, go back home, they are the people who are with entrepreneurial ability. They're the one selling things, doing things, making things, fixing things, and these are the people. So why don't you recognize them as micro-entrepreneur rather than calling them informal economy? If you call this sector informal economy, which is about 70% of the total economy. It's not a tiny piece. 70% of the population belong to the informal sector. And you are since dismissing them because they have no formal job. So instead of dismissing them, you embrace them. Say, no, you are the very important component of the society. You are the real strength of the society because you are micro entrepreneurs. I said, you redesignate the sector by calling it micro entrepreneur sector. The moment you recognize it as a micro-entrepreneur sector, then you see it is a, it's a, it's a part of an entire entrepreneurial pyramid of the whole country, whole economy. In the entrepreneurial uh, pyramid of the economy, uh, you see on the top, the multi-billion dollar people, the entrepreneurs on the top, and you have the multi-million dollar entrepreneurs in the middle. And at the bottom, the micro-entrepreneurs, it's a multi-hundred dollar micro-entrepreneurs. So they belong to the same community, community of entrepreneurs. But these micro-entrepreneurs have no institutional support of any kind. The concept never went that you have to have uh, any kind of uh, in institutions built. I said, why can't we build uh, financial institutions, for example, for the micro-entrepreneurs? Today, all the micro-entrepreneurs in every single country in the world are financed by loan sharks, informal loan sharks. So they have no rules, no, no papers, nothing, no records. They just uh, break your leg, break your head to get your money back and pay you enormous, you have to pay enormous amount of interest and you have to pay uh, by your throat, your uh, life to pay back the money. And they, they become victims of all this. Why don't we have formal institutions, so micro entrepreneurs, uh, we can create banks for them. I uh, said, so why don't we create social business micro entrepreneur bank? So that it's, it's not a bank to make money, unlike the conventional banks, we said we can create social business micro-entrepreneur micro banks. And then they have access to finance. Then we can create micro, uh, social business investment funds for the micro-entrepreneurs, social business equity funds for micro-entrepreneurs, social business um, venture capital fund micro-entrepreneurs. Whatever financial institutions you have for the multi-billion dollar guys, you can also have the same thing, exactly the same thing, but in a smaller scale, in a lighter scale, for the uh, multi-hundred dollar entrepreneurs too. They are as, in, as much entrepreneur as anybody else. And then I point out, it, looking at this uh, kind of a, treating them as a separate group of people, uh, we, we have uh, labor as a recognized uh, uh, the formal economy. In the, and we have a labor ministry. The labor ministry is a very strong ministry and a labor Ministry has lots of agencies taking care of the labor. Has, and it's good that they have recognized the formal labor and created a ministry and created agencies, created institutions to support them, give them leg, legal rights, legal, legal uh, 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 deals with the uh, employers and so on, all kinds of things, which are good and we should do more of them. There's no problem. But I said, why can't we create now a ministry of micro entrepreneurs? These are the 70% of the population. So 70% of the population needs a ministry to look after them, to create their policies, to create institutions, make sure that they can handle their life in a better way, uh, improve their life, particularly the women among the micro-entrepreneur uh, micro uh, sector. They are very talented, creative, why don't they adopt them? So this is another kind of thing that you have to recognize in a different way as, a, as an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, they'll be creating their chamber of uh, micro entrepreneurs. So they will have their own associations dealing with the government, with the policies and so on and so forth. So this is a, 
looking at a different way. So when we are talking about creating a new world, we have to create, you think about the new kind of institutions, new kind of policies. That's where we talk about the social businesses. Today, we have only one kind of business, business to make money. I said, that's a very wrong way. Not Making money is not the wrong thing. The, having only one type of business is the wrong thing. Human being is defined in economics as someone who is driven by self-interest. I said, that's where we went wrong in the first place. And we created everything for self-interest. So I said, real human being has two kinds of interest, self-interest and common interest. So on the basis of self-interest, you have created the profit maximizing business. But the moment you recognize that human being also has common interest in their mind, then you have to build another kind of business, business to address the common interest. And that's what we call social business. In that, there is no maximization of profit. There is no uh, uh, kind of force that you put uh, in your uh, business to make money for yourself. So we, what do we do? This is, this is a business to solve problem without any intention of making money for yourself. So in the one hand is a maximization of personal profit. In this new business that I'm proposing is a zero personal profit. So social business is zero personal profit. And we do it because we want to change the world. We want to make things happen with our own business entity, with our own business efforts and so on. So there are opportunity for that kind of idea. So why don't we bring social business into the picture? When we create the new world, as we starting point, we start creating the social business banks, for example, for the micro entrepreneurs. And why only micro entrepreneurs? All kinds of banks. There can be a parallel bank of social business bank because the existing banks are creating the wealth concentration. Banks are the vehicle, the instrument which creates the wealth concentration. So unless we design a banking system different way, we are not getting rid of the wealth concentration. So how do we do it? We create our own banks at the social business bank, meaning that we have no interest in making money. All we wanted to do is to serve people so that they can change their life particularly people at the bottom level, below 50% of the uh, income level, that they can consider where they're completely abundant. Banking system doesn't reach them. So these are the kind of things that we can do. So Corona pandemic has revealed many things, raised many questions, and now gave us a tremendous opportunity. Not only I would say it's an opportunity of lifetime, it's an opportunity maybe of centuries. It will never come back again. So while we are at it, we are still at it, why don't we create the world that we wish? We want to dream that make it real. It's possible to make it real. Only we have to make a start. This is the best way, best time to make that start because we are, the train has stopped. Always remember right now, the train has stopped. Make sure we don't ride this train. We ride a new train so that we go to new destination. I'll stop here and... Uh, Take some questions if we have some time. Thank sure, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mohamed Yunus. Um, thank you for your inspiring talk. So I, I got a lot of questions from the students, so I received all of them, Good. and um, they are very different. Uh, just just want to go back about what you said. Um, yeah. It was very important. Some economists, um, for instance, Schumpeter, truly believe that we can have a growth, we can have an economic growth if we have technological innovation. But it seems that you don't agree so much with this approach. If we heard about what you said about artificial intelligence, for instance, or do you think that there is another way and not just the Schumpeter approach? Well, I mentioned something that I said. Technology can be a blessing. Technology can be a curse. So I'm not against technology. I'm against technology, which is a curse. And in this case, artificial intelligence comes as a curse. So uh, to that extent of technology, I'm against. But about the rest of it is as long as it helps people. Absolutely. There's no problem with the technology. I'm not saying technology has to be stopped. I said only technology that we support which helps people. I don't, I don't support nuclear technology to kill people. I don't support uh, technology for uh, weapons to build weapons for mass destruction. So that doesn't mean I'm against technology. I'm against, I am against wrong use of technology. So this is about the technology, like uh, uh, for example, 
uh, ICT and uh, information and communication technology has revolutionized the whole world. This is the most welcome. But if somebody using this technology, ICT, for uh, uh, doing wrong things, to that extent, I'll stop the technology and that part of the technology. So I'm using, uh, I'm saying that artificial intelligence is wrong. Artificial intelligence has to be opposed. Artificial intelligence has to be stopped if it removes people from its job. That's the only thing I'm saying in a message. <laughs> So that's why you said what is the most important thing is the mind. It's the mindset yep. of people, right? And you said... Absolutely. So the, the question behind it, uh, is it possible, do you think it's possible for people to change their mindset or to do it? No, that's How is what it the possible universities to... are for. That's what the universities are for, education system is for. It's to challenge the old and find the new. If you continue to believe in the same way of doing things, same way of thinking, we didn't need any education. Education, uh, just passing on to the old, old ideas. But education and institutions like universities, like edu edu other educational institutions, and colleges and high schools and so on, they are there to receive the old knowledge and to challenge the old knowledge. It's a continuous process of challenging the knowledge. That's where we broaden the frontier. We go to the new horizon of knowledge. Uh, unless we do that, unless we challenge the old thinking, we we'll never proceed. We we'll get stuck in the same old routine, moving on and on and so on. So that's where mindsets are broken, mindsets are destroyed. Old mindset has to be destroyed to create a new mindset. If you don't do that, we are not doing the education. This is a misnomer of education. Education is all about destroying the old, create new. That's education. Thank you for this message, because as you know, that we have more than 100 students, two or 400 students. So that's a good message to the students to make sure that they will attend all yes. courses all yes. the times and they yes. will be focused Absolutely. on what you can say. Absolutely. <laughs> students have to challenge. A student have to challenge what the teacher is saying. If a student just learn what the teacher, nothing, never challenged it, then it's, to, it's obsolete. It's gone. Finish. It's, it doesn't go anywhere. So you have to challenge everything. You have to. Uh, see that uh, the, the, something that is not right. So you have to point mm -hmm. it out and change it. That's why the pro process moves on, it goes to the new stage. Otherwise, it's an old rotten thing being just uh, handled again and again. It's, it's never get, get out of it. You mentioned, um, and of course, the microcredit as well as Grameen Bank, for instance, tap into the poverty for sure, so the, the zero poverty. And to what extent microcredit Tap, can tap into the two other zero, the carbon as well as um, the, 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 the second one, the, the three zero that you mentioned. Yeah, you see, uh, the carbon is also related to all people. It's not just uh, uh, rich people only doing that. In everyday life, we create, uh, we contribute to carbon. For example, Unemployment, yeah. We, uh, and yeah, we uh, use uh, fossil fuel in our daily life. So if we decide that, no, we are not going to use the fossil fuel anymore, we want to have the renewable energy in our own daily use. Uh, we consume a lot of things which uh, uses uh, plastic or uses fossil fuel. As a consumer, even a small consumer, I can decide that I don't want to buy anything which has fossil fuel content in it, or it has a plastic content in it, or it has anyway. For example, meat eating. Meat eating uh, contributes to global warming. So if I'm aware of that, I will make sure that I don't want to eat meat, uh, particularly beef, uh, because beef relates to uh, global warming. So I, I should uh, stay away from that. So it's everybody's thing. So, so and also I can create this uh, uh, businesses, uh, renewable energy businesses and so on. The moment I want to go in, involved into doing new things, I need financing. So that's where the microcredit and all this become, all the investment funds become important. That's why financial institutions play a very important role. Today, financial uh, uh, institutions are just a uh, uh, handmaiden of the rich people. They, they are the one who benefits from the financial institution. People in general, people below the 50% level have nothing to do with the financial system. Financial system never bothered about them. And they are left to the uh, uh, loan sharks, like payday lenders, uh, like pawn shops, uh, you have everywhere. Uh, even in Paris, you'll see lots of pawn shops, lots of payday lenders, and so on and so forth. All over the United States, uh, it's filled with payday lenders and pawn shops and everything. So 
why should they exist when you have the financial system? So we hide country and, and, and uh, expand the financial system so that nobody has to go to the loan sharks. Everybody has a legitimate way of doing business. And that's where the social business comes. Money-making businesses will not go there because they don't have attractive return from that. So we said, we are not interested in the return. We're interested in helping people. So we create social businesses to have social business institutions, financial institutions, so that everybody has a legitimate share of their institutional support, financial support and so on. So we have to redesign the entire financial sector as one uh, and address all those issues as, as a whole. You mentioned very clearly that we know we, who is responsible for the carbon footprint. So if I sure. have in mind just 100 company represent 71 percent of the carbon emission, right. it's something yeah. like that. So we know the name, as you said, we know the name, we yeah. know the gesture, we know exactly who are those kind of people. There is two questions behind. The first question is actually, how is it possible to convince them to change? How could we convince that just that batch of people, 100 people, to change their practice? And the second question behind that, it's, I am a student, 20, 20, 22 years old. I had a loan because to pay the, school, the, 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 the schools, because I need to pay the apartments, sure. uh, and so on and so, off and so forth. And I had an opportunity to work for those kind of company. Yeah. Should I go in or not? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, on the question of uh, the big companies that are uh, doing this uh, for self well, uh, we're referring to them as them. I don't want to refer to them as them because we are same. We are not different. Uh, my brother works as a CEO of one of those companies or your uncle works as a CEO of another company. They're, they're not separate from the society. They're part of our society. Or your mother is working or your father is working. Somebody's working there. So we, we sit in that dining table and the breakfast table together, discuss the same issues. So they are not coming from another world. It's not a colonial um, occupation by some other planet and so on. It is us. We decide what kind of world we want. That's why our children, when we talk, well, I'm the CEO of Big Fossil Fuel Company number one, which is contributing to the global warming. But my child, which is a 15 year old, is marching on the street as a, a, a future uh, Fridays for the future. So I have to now stick. What, what, and he's accusing me, my, his father, accusing me that I've been totally responsible, that I have cre I've been so cruel that I've created a world which doesn't give any future for my child. So I have to think about it. So I'm just saying that you have to think. It's, it's, it's not somebody ordering you. It's your world, it's your child world. So you have to, it's not somebody else in, in Asia or Africa or that in America, their child is talking, it's your child. The, is, is marching, is, is not limited to uh, uh, streets of Dhaka. It's a street, every single street and it's your children, your uh, cousins are working, uh, marching on the street. So we have to come to the terms that you have to see what you can do. So every fossil fuel company can start with creating a renewable energy company. So this is one first thing that, okay, we, have, we cannot shut it down. For, for me, I can do contribute. Uh, let me start a uh, green energy company on the side so that I can gradually switch on. So you have to come up with ideas for how we can turn it off and go to the next one. You just, okay, this is the only one and you have to support uh, this fossil fuel. Otherwise the economy is in trouble and I make it a no-go situation. It's not... A, question of no-go situation. It's, it's, it's your, do you want to hand over this planet as a safer planet for your child? This is the question you have to answer. Do, do, and you ask your children to hand over this world, still safer world, to the grandchildren of you, so that your grandchildren will have much better life. Today, you are doing reverse. You inherited a planet, and then you hand it over to your children much worse. Probably he cannot even complete his life before he uh, blows up the whole world and then forget about your grandchildren. So this is the basic question. It's not he or me or they or us. It's we are same, but that idea has to come. And your 22 year old that you're talking about, they are from those families too. If you look around, they either they are working there or they're uh, somehow connected with them. So if you continue to raise these issues with them, uh, they will be the, the one who will be raising this issue and help uh, finding solutions for them. We have to find the solutions rather than 
uh, stay in our comfort zone. Yes, now uh, I can, I'm happy, I'm, I got everything, so who cares for everybody else? It's not like that. Uh, about the 22-year-old who's taking a job, you, you can take a job if you need a job. Uh, uh, you go there, but you go there to change it, not to just follow what they're doing. You say that, look, you're doing the wrong thing. The time has come, you come with alternative for them. You come prepared that this, look, this is what you do. You can bring your business and this is how you gradually shift from the fossil fuel to the uh, renewable energy. And we don't have much time. Your fossil fuel and everything will go over in the next, well, how many years? 20 years, 30 years, that's all. It is all. The game is over. So we have to show that the game is over. Before the game is over, we can change the game completely. Don't let it just explode and finish. The world is over. Thank you, Professor Yunus. Maybe to conclude, I have a, I have on the list a personal question, which is: Go ahead. Did your life change when you received your Nobel Prize? Well, that, that is very important because a Nobel Prize is such a prize as a, it draws attention from everybody. So globally, um, it draws many attention. Uh, there are many prizes, many awards in the world but you hardly see it in the newspaper. But this is one prize, Nobel Prize. The moment it's announced, every single newspaper in the world, every single television in the world is the first news. Such and such person get the Nobel Prize in such and such discipline. So that's the respectability behind it. So what I'm saying that the moment you get it, the whole world's floodlight is on you. Everybody wants to see you, who you are, what you did, what you did. Some say, oh, this is great. Some say, oh, why did he get the Nobel Prize? That's such a simple thing. Why should he get that? So whatever it is, but everybody is talking about you. So that gives you a tremendous amount of attention, tremendous amount of exposure. So I would say this is an advantage, advantage for the person who has received it to explain what it is. Why is it important? You, I have been screaming my head off to explaining why it is important to have the microcredit come in bank and so on. Nobody paid any attention or very few people paid attention, very close close to me. But the moment you had the Nobel Prize, every single person on this planet, on this one day at least, they knew about Grameen Bank, they knew about microcredit. And they debated about it in their home, in their table, in their dining table, in their living room. Is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? Nobody says it's a bad idea. Everybody says it's a good idea. Then the question is, why aren't you doing it? What's wrong with it? But gradually, that attention disappears. It doesn't, because the next guy comes next year, he gets all the, or she gets all the attention. And the attention from the first one disappears. But you have to take advantage of what you have done and what you want to tell. What's your story? What is your message that you want to do? So we want to do that. So I would say it was an advantage. It's a, it's a very lucky thing. Anybody could have received it instead of me, but uh, something, it happened. But I take the advantage that 